morning. Good morning. Oh, come on, it's not that sleepy of a day. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day in Wichita Falls as we come together to worship Christ and to share with one another. And we welcome everyone that's also going to be watching this service online or wherever they're watching it. Announcement I did not make before service is for you to help put out as well. If you have friends or part of this church that feel that it is still unsafe to come to church, and uh, we do recognize and honor that, uh, do help them to know that this Wednesday from 11 to 12 here in the main sanctuary, we will be uh, serving communion. Now, the uniqueness of this is, is that you have to call the church office in advance and you'll be given a time, or you can tell us what time you can be here between 11 and 12, and we'll mark you down for that time. So actually, individuals will only be by family uh, or individuals coming up to take communion, and then following communion, you will leave, and the next group will come in. Uh, and this is to facilitate those who are a little frightened still of being able to take communion and being in a group that uh, is large or larger and so uh, please let the members know that let your friends know that that they are not excluded from communion but they're welcome to come here and uh, we will partake then so we're glad that y'all are here and let's begin our worship let's begin this morning by seeing verses one and three of a mighty fortress is our god
follow him, your life got tough. Because at that point, you were torn between the Holy Spirit, convenient grace within us, and the power of sin still living within us. We seem to forget when we come here that every child born today is born in sin. That doesn't sprout sometime along their life. They're born of the sin of Adam. When Adam and Eve ate of the apple, original sin was born in each of us and the descendants that was there. And suddenly, by the grace of God, we have free will to choose. It's a horrible thing, free will, but it's part of what makes God the magnificent God that God is. The other thing that I think we look at is that uh, we don't talk about sin enough in the sense of what is sin. I don't get to do confirmation classes as often as what I would like to do them, but one of the things I always find is I ask at first to those kids, define sin. Oh, and they start, well, stealing is a sin, and they turn back around, not honoring your mother and father is a sin. And that's not my question. Define sin. Well, sin itself in definition is the absence of God. The absence of God within each one of us as we stand here today. It is those things that we think that God doesn't see, but it's those things that God is not part of in our life. John Wesley said, all sin is premeditated. We think about it. It didn't just happen. We took all the cookies out of the cookie jar. Mom, I walked by and it just happened. No, we thought about it. All sin is premeditated. And that becomes part of that struggle. See, he's saying that what's going on in us is a struggle a conflict, actually an inner warfare going on within us. Paul says in Ephesians that we battle the principalities of darkness. He wasn't talking about the world. He was talking about individuals who claim to have Christ within themselves, that every day we still battle that darkness. And he was telling us that's where he was. I learned a new word this week in my study, and that was Walt Kelly for the morphology. And I walked, wow, a new word, morphology. The morphology is a saying, but what Walt Kelly said that was important was, we have met the enemy, and he is us. I've met the enemy, and he is us. Paul's dealing with that warfare. Lord, I, I'm your child. I met you on the road to Damascus. I have studied. I have become your preacher. But still within me is that struggle. And every time I want to turn around and blame the rest of the world, social media calls it sin. No. Sorry. Uh, Walmart calls it sin. Sorry. I've met the enemy, and he's within me. Paul said it twice. He said very plainly, as it is no longer I do myself doing it, but it's a sin living in me. The sin living in me. I'm asking you, as the people of God, and honestly, as mature Christians and those who will be growing into maturity, I want you to know that this is to us. We're not sitting here as saints today. You don't get to straighten your halo. What you get to do is come before God and admit our struggle. Paul says within the scripture there are three struggles of the believer that he actually works with in this. And he says the first one is the struggle to live up to what you know you ought to be. The struggle to live up to know what you ought to be. You know, this is a real struggle. 
He said it again in that 15 through 17 verses. He says, I do not understand what I do, for what I do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do and want to do, I agree the law is good as long as it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Sort those dudes out. But he's saying bluntly, it's not me. It's a sin living in, within me. It is that real creation within us. As I spoke earlier about every child that is born, born with that original sin, I have to be able to go back and say, friend, we ourselves are the ones that are going to cultivate the Spirit of God within these children and the children yet to be born. And if they look at us and we ourselves can't face the struggle within ourselves to be able to say that sin is real, then we become that society and that church that says, it's okay, God loves you. You don't have to worry about it. Yes, you do have to worry about it. I've begun thinking that we are cultivating a bunch of butterfly Christians where we flutter from flower to flower to flower, collecting the sweet nectar, rather than being the Christians who are supposed to go cultivate the ground and plant the seed for the future. I want to be able to live up to what I ought to be. One of the harsh experiences of my life was right after I gave my life to Christ, I remember doing something wrong. Calm down. It's okay. I want you to know that. But I remember the word told to me by the adult was, and you call yourself a Christian. That's dumb. It's not what drove me to ministry, but that stung. It meant that as I'm cultivating the ground, people are looking at me. There are times as a minister, even within our faults, and I can say this and confess it because I know you've got the same confession. And that is I will think something or I will say something. They say, you can't think that way. You're a minister. Not I, but the sin that lives within me. It's a struggle that is real, that's there. Yes, the law is good. The gospel is there to lead us. It's a blessing. But we face this every day. He says, the struggle to come to grips with repeated personal failure. Now, not by a show of hands or even the shake of a head. How many of y'all repeat your sin? I do. And then once I do that, I beg God for forgiveness and I go and do it again. You see, Paul's word about this internal struggle, this battle that's going on, is real within the Christian life. It's something that we need to realize that this is who we are. As you've heard me say, for going on nine years from Augustine, God forgive me the sinner and I the greatest sinner of all. Because it's real, it's true. He says the struggle to admit the true nature of the war within. To admit that battle. You see, the law is at work because it tells us and it gives us guidance. It gives us a moral foundation. And we know that, and we support it, and we stand up for it. But we have to realize, because of the war within, we don't always follow that ourselves. So I can end the sermon right here and say, hopeless. All is hopeless. But it's not. Because Paul, within this work, pointing it out, and pointing out his own personal struggle, wanted us as Christians mature and still maturing and younger ones who are going to mature in their faith that this struggle is real. And the things that we can help with and we can help us within that is first of all, we as the church being able to admit to our children it's real. I want to tell you right now, if you have family problems with your children 
I want you to tell you that one of the things that you can do is to tell them as they raise their children, let your children see that you love each other. Grandparents, you can do the same thing. It's easier to do with a partner. But the fact is, is when those grandchildren or those great-grandchildren come in, let them see you get a pillow and hit the other one with it. You know what? They'll grab it and they'll join in. They watch by our action. Families who are watching, let them see you hold hands. Now let's turn it to the spiritual battle. Let them see you and hear you pray for them by name. Let them see you look into their eyes and tell them about the Christ who saved your soul. But Paul says in his, in that 24th and 25th verses, he says, be honest with yourself and where you stand before God. He says, what a wretched man I am. This is Paul, the apostle. This is the Pharisee of Pharisees. He's saying, what a wretched man I am, and I remain without the Holy Spirit of Christ within me. Because I can't do this. And in that honesty, when we really look and say, I stand before people, I stand before all people, and I'm speaking of all of us, and we confess Jesus Christ, and we look honestly within ourselves and say, you know what, once I was like this. There's an old story about a woman who walked into the church one day, and uh, she wasn't really the type of person you would ever think walked into a church. And she walked in, and everyone stared and started whispering, and she came down to about the second pew, and she sat down, because no one sits in those pews, or are very few. And everyone was staring and grumbling, and finally, one of the other ladies got up and moved from the back and sat next to her and whispered, I was just like you. Honesty. We cultivate the future, but we have to be honest with our presence. He says the next thing Paul says is humility. Not something we see very often. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul the Apostle talking. And realize that the difference between honesty and humility is one is to say, I am a wretched man. The other is saying, I cannot save myself. I can't save myself. No matter what I do, no matter what science I know, no matter what math I may figure out, I can't save myself. The humility is for the Christian to be able to say, I am saved by grace and grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ due to his death and resurrection. Be, have that humility. And he says the other in that 25th verse, complete dependency on God. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in his life of contradiction. A dependency upon Christ. A dependency upon Christ. Friends, we ourselves ought to be walking this path with that dependency of being able to look for Christ within our life and for once to stand up and not care whether you're Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever, but to care whether or not it is Jesus Christ who is within our life and who we are. These three things become the honest nature of what Paul struggles with in himself. He's saying, wretched man am I, I'm being honest. He's saying that I can't save myself. He's showing humility. And he's saying, I need Christ and I need him today. Dependence. Each of us fight that battle. 
And yes, each of us can look back and we can blame all the outside factors of life, but there's one person who can only stand before God, and that's you. And there's one person that can only stand before God who is your advocate, and that's Jesus Christ. And today, I ask you to look and remember what Paul has said. We all face this struggle. I face it. You face it. But today, we need to be honest with ourselves as Christians. Today, we need to show that humility, and today, we need to call upon God for that dependence. A dependence that says, here am I, sinful man. Please take my you know, we sit back and we watch. Up until Friday, the sermon today was supposed to be on the church. But as we prepare for the church to reopen, whenever that's going to be, are we going to prepare for it just to reopen the way that it was and we go back to the way that we were? Are we going to prepare to open it as Christians?